nation know, whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe, to ensure the survival and the success of liberty. What's up, everybody? And welcome to the Lone Gunman Comcast, as my son says. Uh, he wanted to help me out a little bit today. This is episode number 21, Senorita Marita. And today we're going to talk a little bit about Marita Lorenz. But before we do, let me first thank everybody out there listening. And checking out the 22 November Network uh, site. Our website has received almost 2,500 hits in the past two weeks. Which is simply amazing. Now, of course, there's amazing content there that we do just for you. Uh, But, uh, yeah, the response has been overwhelming. And I, I couldn't be happier. I couldn't be prouder of uh, everybody here at the network Doug doing an amazing job of course on Black Op and on the Dallas Action our three fabulous bloggers have been tearing it up as well I uh, can't speak highly enough of them and I've even cranked out a couple blogs myself uh, one on uh, Marina Oswald and the other uh, talking about Oswald's DOD card So if you want to check those out, head over to the website. You can find the links to the website on my Spreaker info page. It's real easy. Everything is one click away. The website, the Facebook page, Twitter, it's all right there. One click away. Just hit the info button under my big ugly mug there. You'll see it. Uh, Also, let me... uh, uh, thank everyone for the wonderful feedback you've given us um, on the Facebook page and the website. You know, that's what we do it for. We, uh, we're we here to make you think. We're here to create a conversation. And we're here to stimulate your brains. And uh, hopefully together we will get somewhere. We will make headway on this case. And last year was the course the 50th anniversary of the assassination of JFK this year is the 50th anniversary of the Warren report and there is going to be a conference in Alexandria Virginia on September 26th through the 28th at the Crown Plaza East Hotel and it's and it's gonna be a critical look uh, back at the uh, Warren report 50 years later and like I said, it's going to be an amazing event. They're going to have Cyril Weck as a keynote speaker uh, at the banquet. They're going to have guys like uh, Francis, uh, Francis Gary Powers Jr., um, Phil Janney, or I'm sorry, Peter Janney, Phil Nelson, Doug Horn. And the good news is that me and Doug are going to be there live and in person and we'd like you to join us there if possible um it's a a short close by um 
Hop 195. It's a quick train ride from New York. It's a short plane hop from anywhere in the Midwest or on the East Coast. Get there. It's going to be historic. Uh, and me and Doug are going to be there as well. And we're going to have fun, fun, fun. Let me tell you. Um, you know, the name of, of, of Zero X uh, conference last year was Passing the Torch. And I don't see anybody else grabbing for it. Okay? So, it's up to us, the grassroots JFK uh, research community, to take that torch and carry on the fight, carry on the research, uh, carry on exposing the government lies and cover-ups and corruption. And we'd like for you to join us there and take a critical look back at that lying piece of crap Warren report that they tried to pull or that they tried to put on the American people and believe it and believe me a lot of people did and didn't look twice at it uh, you know there were a lot of people like us who didn't believe it uh, like Mark Lane to name a few well he's not the only one and he's not a few but you get the point Anyway, we'd like to see you there at the conference. It's September 26th through the 28th in Alexandria, Virginia. Get there if you can. If you cannot, stay tuned to all aspects of the 22 November Network. We are going to be bringing you a ton of coverage, interviews, hopefully some video. Uh, we're definitely going to be doing podcasts live from the spot. Okay? And we're going to let you know what's going on. But we'd really like to see you there and hang out with you and uh, make it a really fun environment. Now, <clears throat> let's get on with Senorita Marita. Mm, okay. <laughs> now, Marita Lorenz, if some of you don't know who she is, um, I'm going to give you a, a quick overview. She was supposedly a CIA asset who attempted to assassinate Castro. And, of course, didn't do it. Uh, got hooked up with Frank Sturgis. And was involved slightly with the assassination. I'll get to her story in a minute. Um, of course, Mar there is no Marita Lorenz in the uh, Warren Commission or the Garrison investigation. Uh, she was tracked down for the HSCA. And uh, her testimony is, is unclassified or declassified. But it's 200 pages long. And I just don't have the patience to sit here on my phone and read 200 pages of tedious uh, manuscript court type crap. It's really not interesting, most of it. Um, but I have read that she did. Uh, Explain a little bit of her involvement, in, you know, in the uh, Kennedy assassination and things about Castro and, you know, what she was doing. I don't, I don't believe she named names, uh, except for Frank Sturgis. I don't believe she named names to the HSCA. Um, that came later when she was Mark Lane's star witness in the uh, Liberty Lobby Liberty Lobby lawsuit. Say that 50 times fast. Liberty Lobby Lawsuit. I can't even say it once. Anyway, the Liberty Lobby Lawsuit. Uh, that that uh, Mark Lane was defending the Liberty Lobby. Shit, there it goes again. The Liberty Lobby. Okay, from a defamation suit by E. Howard Hunt. Uh, claiming he was in uh, Dealey Plaza that day and took part in the assassination. 
and Hunt was suing them for defamation, and Mark Lane was the Liberty Lobby, shit, god damn it, the Liberty Lobby lawyer, okay, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that anymore in this podcast, I swear to God, um, you get the point, he wrote a book called Plausible Denial about it, uh, so if you'd like the full story, please go read Mark Lane's book, Plausible Denial, okay, now what? Marita claims, okay, is after being back, you know, of course, from Cuba and hooking up with Frank Sturgis, uh, they were in Miami. And I think it was a couple, two days, three days before the assassination, she, she claims to take part in a little caravan to Dallas from Miami, a two car caravan. And she claims it was Frank Sturgis, uh, Jerry Hemming, uh, Pedro Diaz Lanz, and the Novo Brothers. And a car full of guns. I think it was, you know, of course, the second car had guns all in it. But her story is they made the trek to Dallas. And upon arriving in Dallas at this hotel, um, she claims to have witnessed E. Howard Hunt come to the hotel and give Frank Sturgis a sizable envelope full of money, cash money. And uh, said he stayed for about half hour, 45 minutes. They were talking about the assassination. Um, And then a little while later, um, claims Jack Ruby shows up and is talking to them for a little while well the next day she tells Sturgis look you know I, I feel kind of feel like physically ill about all this you know I just want to leave I want to go I don't want to be anywhere near Dallas you know so he says fine takes her to the airport and puts her on a plane Sends her back to Miami. And, uh, of course, you know the rest of the story. What happened that day? Um, of course, we don't know the details. Um, but, you know, of course, it's been alleged that E. Howard Hunt and Frank Sturgis were a couple of the tramps. And I have addressed this in my, uh, podcast I think it was arrested in Dealey Plaza about the tramps and how I don't think that they're hunting Sturgis and Rogers or Holt Harrelson and Rogers or whatever combination you want to make out of all of them I don't think it was any of them just photographically to my eye none of them are a match um, now that's not saying they weren't tramps and they weren't in Dealey Plaza but the pictures, the famous pictures that we have of them, I don't believe are of Hunt, Sturgis Harrelson, Holt okay just to establish where I'm coming from on all this now where exactly they were, I couldn't tell you you know, as far as being situated in the plaza itself or who was shooting from where or anything like that and, I, and a lot of people don't put much faith in Marita Lorenz because uh, she's a very foul-mouthed woman. Uh, details tend to emerge that weren't there before, or the story changes a little bit. And in fact, uh, at the Lib- Lib- fuck, Liberty Lobby, shit. The Liberty Lobby Trial. Man. The Liberty Lobby Trial. Uh, She told Mark Lane that she did not want to uh, expose anything that was, you know, or expose any CIA operatives. And, uh, of course, he abided by that. He did not ask her for that. But the defense did. The defense put her on the spot 
And she figured, you know, look, because the reason she didn't say anything before the age of CA is because she was afraid for her life. Okay, Frank Sturgis is a crazy mercenary type son of a bitch. I mean, he didn't mess around. If he thought that there was anything that could take him down or he didn't trust you, that was it. You're done. Okay, I mean, I'm sure this dude killed over 100, you know, over 100 people in his life. And that's no exaggeration. I mean, there's a famous picture of him standing on the grave of 60 some Cubans that he just mowed down. And that's in one day. So I'm sure, you know, a figure of 100 in his life is not over exaggerating. So she was scared. And, uh, you know, she didn't want to reveal names. Uh, but uh, the attorney for E. Howard Hunt asked her. So she figured, well, look, you know, he's with, he's with the CIA. She's a CIA lawyer. If she wants to bring this stuff out in, in open court, so be it. Here it is, you know. And if, 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 anything, if anybody said anything, be like, look, you asked me, you know. You shouldn't have asked me if you didn't want anybody to know. So she opened her mouth and she talked. And I think the problem with the Liberty, Liberty Lobby lawsuit was that they could put E. Howard Hunt in Dallas on the 21st but not on the 22nd and I mean, anyway they weren't found guilty of, of defamation I don't believe but uh, it's just a big whole crazy thing if you read plausible denial it's you know you know Hunt's got an alibi but uh, it's not really an airtight one you know, I think he was shopping at a grocery store or he was working at an ad agency and so I don't know what he was doing. So, you know, and of course I've heard the Marita Loren story before. And, you know, people don't like to talk about it because they don't put much faith in it. Which is fine. Uh but why would the woman lie about it? as far back as the HSCA why would she lie about a plot to kill the president now in the late 70s when Frank St when they were in New York Frank Sturgis threatened to beat the shit out of her or maybe he did I'm, I'm not sure which uh, but the arresting officer that arrested Frank Sturgis the, uh, the detective Sturgis admitted to him that he was in Dealey Plaza that day and he was part of the assassination. He admitted it to a detective. Now, of course, the detective couldn't do anything about it at the time. It wasn't a federal crime at the time and then it occurred. It was a state crime. He was in New York. This is Texas. Texas wasn't pressed about prosecuting anything. It is what it is. Now, as I said, Marita Lorenz claims that Jerry Hemming was along for the ride. And, of course, Jerry Hemming denies it. Um, well, maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. It's hard to say what Jerry Hemming says, but uh, he says something different just about every time you talk to him. Um, but, of course, he denies... Uh, being a shooter now if he was truly a shooter and I've ran this over with Doug before um, just something to think about because I know Doug likes to pin uh, Lauren Hall and Howard and that bunch as being shooters and using Hemming's gun now the gun in question the Johnson 30 out of 6 that was Hemmings he found out that Hall took it before the assassination the guy called him and, and told him and he, he went and reported it stolen to the police and he told him he stole it but I mean these were just the authorities in Florida 
And I've also seen a report where he says that he got his rifle back before the assassination, which would mean that in Dallas, he used that rifle to set up Lauren Hall as possibly a second patsy or I don't know. Maybe Lorraine Hall had the rifle and he was doing the shooting. Maybe Jerry Hemming had the rifle and he was doing the shooting. But he was smart enough to wear gloves and leave Lauren Hall's fingerprints on the rifle. I don't know. I'm just speculating here. Um, you know, Things get confusing when you try to nail down the operators in the plaza and who they were and where they were. Because there's 20,000 opinions about that uh, so we can skip that just skip that little piece for now this is a little something to think about now what made me rethink the Marita Lorenz testimony was I recently found a book and it was a hell of a bargain four bucks so I got it and I've always wanted to read it and I hadn't read it before, called Oswald Talked by Ray and Mary LaFontaine. Now, before half of you turn off the podcast and, and call me an idiot and a loon for believing these people, let me explain. Okay. I know a lot of people don't put any faith in these two. They think they are uh, trash journalists you know out for fame they think their documents on the true tramps and uh, John Elrod are false but let me explain this and they explain it in the book but I know a lot of people haven't read the book but they just go along with what everybody else says about the book and I've heard the rumors too before that it's a book full of nonsense until I re read it for myself <coughs> and find that it's a well written, uh, well documented and I'm only done like the first three chapters you know I'm not even done the whole book yet but <coughs> The first chapter addresses uh, John Elrod, who was arrested uh, a couple blocks away down by the railroad tracks that day after somebody put in a report of seeing somebody with a rifle walking along the tracks. And we've heard this report before. Actually, it was the first report. Uh, from uh, McNeil I think is his name uh, back to NBC stating that everyone was heading for the railway or they were chasing a, uh, a gunman uh, down through the rail down through the rail yard and that was his first report back to NBC he, and he was calling from the Texas School Book Depository to say that Now, back to Elrod. Okay, Elrod was admittedly a drunk. Uh, not really educated well. Um, he was in Dallas uh, with his with his wife at the time, and he was working at his brother-in-law's restaurant as a cook, and. He was, like I said, admittedly down on his luck. Although he wasn't really a homeless tramp, you might say. He was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And scooped up. And he was placed in a jail cell. And depending on what floor and what little pod, I don't even know what they called them pods then, but they were like cell blocks and according to Elrod Oswald was in the same cell, cell block as him now I don't know if it's the same cell or if he could 
you know, look across the way and see Oswald, but he said he spoke of him, uh, you know, they, that he could see him on the toilet. So, <clears throat> now the interesting thing is there were a couple people already in jail uh, for a couple things. And an interesting one is uh, the day before there was a gun running bust and they were pursued and the car was wrecked and the driver of the car had to go to the hospital and the passenger his head went through the windshield which caused numerous lacerations all over his face uh, but other than that he was pretty much okay so he didn't get to stay in the hospital he got to go to jail and they can tie this gun running into uh, Jack Ruby and Thomas Mason <clears throat> and I haven't got that far in the book yet to figure out who this other person in the jail was but they had spoke of being in a motel and seeing a Thunderbird, the dark blue sports car that crashed, uh, and and guns and everything changed hands and money changed hands. Now the gun turned out to be from an armory. Uh, I think from you know a couple towns over, whatever it was. And taken from a place where it would have required inside knowledge because the guns weren't stored where they were normally stored. And uh, they were set to be sent for repair or whatever, but which indicates, you know, somebody with knowledge tipping these guys off where to get these guns. Now, the person who said they witnessed this meeting said that uh, Jack Ruby was there. And also Oswald was there. He came later. And El, of course Elrod is overhearing all this stuff. And I think they let him out of jail um, the next day or whatever after, you know, it was pretty much figured that Oswald was a lone assassin. And uh, a couple people ended up going down real quick and after Oswald was killed he realized that he might know some things that he probably shouldn't know so he hauls ass back to Memphis Tennessee where he was from leaves his wife there and everything he goes back to live with his mom well eventually you know his wife moves back and they live make their home in Tennessee well, a couple years later, his conscience catches up to him. Or maybe it wasn't a couple years. Maybe it was in 64. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I want to say 64 or 67. He went to the uh, FBI office there in Tennessee and spilled his guts to him. Told him that he was Oswald's cellmate. Told him what he overheard, uh, what, you know, what he knew. Uh, when they cross-referenced his story, they couldn't find any record of his arrest or, or of him being in jail on the 22nd. So they dismissed his story as being, you know, that of a crazy person wanting to be associated with something, you know, trying to be famous or whatever, whatever reason they attributed to it. But uh, they, they really didn't pursue it. Um, now, fast forward... You know, 25, 30 years or so, uh, when Mary LaFontaine was going through uh, some Dallas uh, records that had recently, recently been released, and the clerk came up and said, uh, well, we have this other box we've had for a couple years, and but nobody ever really looks at it. She's like, here's what's in it. So she looks at the content list, and it says, arrests. November 22nd, 1963. So she said, well, bring me this file. 
So the clerk brought her the file out. And lo and behold, inside this were the arrest records of the three tramps that are photographed. Uh, you know, Gus Abrams, uh, John Jedney, and Harold Doyle. And also, the arrest report for John Elrod is in it. And of course, the book is her, is her story, or their story, of tracking this guy down now, 25, 30 years later, and getting, you know, the story straight from the horse's mouth. And... Like I said, I haven't gotten that far, but I know they did find him, and I know they did interview him. I have seen the interview, or a part of the video interview. You know, I think it's from Hard Copy or you know whatever shit magazine, TV magazine it was on, or Inside Edition or whatever, whatever it was on. And uh, you know, of course, this all coincided with the book coming out, which was right after the movie JFK, and it was. You know, they were riding a pretty high tide there. And, you know, these were not just any random people. Uh, you know, her and her husband, I think, had jobs, both, both had jobs at a, a pretty prominent Houston newspaper. Uh, you know, these weren't your average, uh, you know, they weren't like from the Inquirer or anything. You know what I mean? They were they were working at you know respected publishing houses, you know along the lines of Jim Mars, Penn Jones, uh, you know people like that 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 write for newspapers and that you know research the assassination. And but there was a lot of backlash, and of course some of the backlash can be attributed to you know of course <laughs> you know the, the CIA. Uh, paid naysayers who who find little problems or create little problems in the story and the narrative to throw people off uh, you know to, to trash them to trash their work uh, but so far I'm impressed uh, because they did a really good work and it inspired me to condense and compile it a little different uh, for the for the website their work on the uh, the Oswald DOD card that was found in his wallet when he was uh, arrested and very interesting stuff about that because it pretty much proves he was working for the government I mean beyond a shadow of a doubt uh, he, he was issued this DOD card which um granted him services and privileges uh, but it was supposed to be for dependents of active duty military and as we know the DOD car was issued the day his last day in the Marine Corps therefore he wasn't active duty anymore and he wasn't anybody's dependent that was in the military anymore. Um, you know, he got his hardship, uh, his hardship uh, request granted to uh, leave early. Uh, you know, we know he went home for about a week, and then he's off to Europe, and then Russia. Now, the interesting thing about this DOD card is that. Uh, Francis Gary Powers, who was shot down over Russia, uh, piloting the U-2, well, had the very exact same kind of card. And at the time Powers was flying the U-2, he was not active duty military. Uh, he was a civilian um, CIA asset or operative, you know, doing these spy flights. Okay, he, was, he wasn't working for the military, he was working for the CIA doing these overflights and he had a card exactly like this where the picture is on the left side and same as Oswald's and is it it's the exact same kind of card that grants him services and privileges and it's 
really an interesting read and if you'd like to read more about it head over to the 22 November Network find the blog post about it it'll knock your socks off and the kicker is that you know the La Fontaine's uncovered that you know not only was this particular card issued to uh, dependents it was uh, in reservists it was it was issued to uh, civilians civilian agents uh, in need of military identification overseas which would apply to Gary Powers and it would apply to Lee Oswald and it would also indicate that they were working for the CIA and they had military identification they granted them services and privileges of the commissary uh, you know, to, to get into the base uh, to eat to get medical uh, treatment things like that very interesting stuff so if you, if you want to check that out also uh, since we last talked Gail Nix Jackson has put up a, a post positing who the mysterious black couple was uh, seen upon the knoll there and uh, seeing if we could figure out who they were maybe they could shed a little light on events taking place upon that knoll uh, because there's a mysterious some some call it a soda bottle broke uh, some call it a pool of blood some call it a melted snow cone either way there was some kind of a red liquid up there and I heard reports of other people being injured in Dealey Plaza that day and but you never you never hear about any of that just the rumors that people were you don't hear any official reports coming from the hospital or the doctors at Parkland you know if they were even taken to Parkland I don't know but with all the bullets flying around Dealey Plaza that day I'm surprised nobody except JFK and Connolly got shot now I know Tay got chipped and hit but with all the the misses and ricochets and you know people lying in the parade route like that and people in the car it, it is amazing that nobody else got shot unless somebody else did get shot uh, you know I don't know you know until we can rule out that it was a pool of blood up there we just don't know uh, but if you'd like to read more about that go check out Gail's newest post <clears throat> on the website and stay tuned because we got coming up a new posts from Martin Rigby who's working on it right now and also the Grassy Knoll girl is working on a new one too and I think we're going to have her part 3 show up here soon too as well about the American Express uh, involvement in the assassination so stay tuned for that and of course check out Black Hop Radio and Down the Rabbit Hole our brothers of the network uh, they both have fabulous shows and all the links for all that can be found in our about page on the website uh, so please continue to like us continue to follow us continue to comment uh, you know just about all of us are on on Facebook so feel free to message us if you want to talk about anything or if you got something you want to bring to our attention uh, that's great too you know we're, we're, we're here for you this is our little beacon in the night for the JFK research community and uh, there's a lot of guys out there doing great things uh, Senior Dusty Rhodes is working on uh, the Tippett case some really really crazy stuff uh, I might try to get him to do a guest blog on the site about when he's done because it's a multi-part series but it's very very informative and fascinating uh, so good job Dusty Q of the good work brother and uh, you know I think we're gonna start doing that when we see people doing extraordinary things in the research community out there we'd like to showcase them and you know so if you hear from one of us and we reach out to you um, 
that's why we think you're doing something special and uh, probably like you to do a guest uh, blog or article about it to be put up on the website uh, for, for a wider audience than you might be able to get on your own and which of course means more eyes on it more feedback and it's a win-win for everybody um, so stay tuned for that check out my brother from another mother Doug Campbell the Dallas Action podcast every Sunday at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time me I come out whenever I feel like it generally the day before because I like to ride on his coattails a little bit you know he gets a little action on uh, on black op you know it kind of trickles down it's a trickle down theory but I'm not too far behind him so once again thank everybody for listening or yeah thank everybody for listening liking uh, sharing feel free to share any of the links you find on social media to your friends so that they can uh, come experience the same thing you are uh, might be able to get them interested in the case who knows um, but that's the crux of it we need your help to spread the word uh, you know we can only do so much our reach is only so far we only have so many friends on Facebook uh, and we need your help it can be like a six degrees of separation for the world you know what I'm saying there's no limits on how big this can get uh, there's only limits you know on our abilities to do this on our own so we, we need your help to spread the word uh, but once again thank you everybody for listening uh, we couldn't do this without you we love doing it and uh, if you like this podcast hit the little heart on Spreaker help brother out give me some likes uh, follow me on Spreaker give us a follow on the blog um, there's many ways you can stay connected with the 22 November network and we urge you to do so anyway that's it for this week this is your boy Rob Clark sending this feed up to the satellite beaming down directly to your ears and I'm out Okay.